Welcome to the Cutting Edge Health Preventing Cognitive Decline podcast, where we're making 90 the new 40. I'm Jane Rogers. Buckle up for interviews with the world's brightest minds to help you live longer, better. And before we get to our guest, we've listened when you asked for personal help in implementing the ideas from our podcast experts. You may have been trying to make changes, but it can be overwhelming to embrace this cutting edge material. To help you out, I'd like to invite you to join us for two cool new things. Monthly Zooms with a longevity-focused MD or me. Think of this as a time to ask your questions and get answers to speed your progress. Also, do you want the inside skinny on sourcing key molecules, dosing to consider, and learning what's working for me personally? To further guide you, my team and I have put together an extensive online video course called Cutting Edge Health Accelerator. We want to accelerate the implementation of these paradigm shifting scientific breakthroughs in your life. Both these come together in one package to make it easy to slow aging, to be sharper, to live longer, look better, and have more energy. To learn more on how to take advantage of this, go to mycuttingedgehealth.com. Again, that's mycuttingedgehealth.com. Use the coupon code JANE10 at checkout to get 10% off. Our way of saying thank you for being a listener. And now, on to the podcast. Diagnosing Alzheimer's has been challenging while the patient is still alive, but some cutting-edge research happening in Boston is worth paying attention to. Our guest today is Dr. Manju Subramanian. She is studying eye-based biomarkers for Alzheimer's at the Boston Medical Center. Her goal is to look into the eye early, long before the cognitive decline starts, to detect problems in time to turn things around. So Manju, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for the time to share with us about your research. Thank you for having me. So tell us about your life. Tell us about your research. What have you and your team just accomplished? So um, I actually um, am an ophthalmologist and I um, went to uh, medical school and in Kansas City, Missouri. And during medical school, I did some research in the area of neuroscience. Um, And I thought that I would um, go into neuroscience or um, uh, neurology at the time, Um, but I ended up uh, falling in love with ophthalmology. And um, after um, completing my training, I kind of circled back in terms of my research interests to neuroscience. And, um, And so this was actually a great sort of way for me to, um, you know, leverage my interest in neuroscience and apply it to the eye. And so I've been really focused on studying the eye's connection to the brain, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And so for this particular study that, um, you know, uh, you had contacted me about, Mm -hmm. um, we actually found a, a link between eye fluid and we're, we were able to link that to a um, the proteins in the eye fluid to confirmed pathological brain um, diagnoses because diseases like Alzheimer's disease and chronic traumatic encephalopathy are not um, actually confirmed until post-mortem examination of the brain. Th- these are what's called clinical diagnoses um, that are made based on, you know, clinical presentation, but there's no confirmation until, until after death. And so we were able to connect you know, markers in the, in the eye fluid to um, pathological diagnosis in the brain. This is really exciting because you're right. We could not get a a for sure clinical diagnosis until after someone had passed. And so what you're saying, you and your team is able to look at the fluid of the eye, like that little film on the eye or even tears and be able to see in there how early how, how early are you seeing the changes of Alzheimer's? Does it have to be full-blown MCI or, or something before you can see it? Or are you seeing things decades before? Well, you know, that's a really good question. And that, that question sort of remains to be answered. Um, so right now, um, the, the way um, Alzheimer's is diagnosed is, as I was saying, based on clinical findings, as well as a testing such as MRI and PET scan, um, and even, you know, taking fluid from, um, from, uh, from the cerebrospinal fluid from, you know, a lumbar puncture. So fluid that sort of 
um, supports the brain tissue um, and the spinal cord can be extracted and examined. And that's how you, that's how you can help to confirm the diagnosis in a living person. Um, so obviously the, the holy grail really of um, Alzheimer's research is early um, diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? Because the unfortunate thing about Alzheimer's disease is that pathologic changes occur in the brain, as we know, 10 to up to 20 years prior to the onset of symptoms. And by the time you start therapy after symptoms develop, it's often too late to have much meaningful effect pathologically. Mm -hmm. So the holy grail is really early diagnosis and ideally to try to screen for that. Um, but the ideal screening tool is something that's uh, non-invasive and something that's not expensive. So obviously we can't go around screening everybody with MRIs mm -hmm. and we can't, uh, you know, do lumbar punctures on everybody. Um, so the ideal screening tool is like a blood test, right? Where it's minimally invasive and it's relatively inexpensive. And so there's a lot of research now being done on blood-based biomarkers, among other things, such as looking at photographs of the eye, the retina, um, through a um, method called optical coherence tomography that images the cell layers of the retina, which is the nerve tissue layer that lines the inside back wall of the eye and it's connected to the brain. Um, and the retina receives the visual information we see. So there's a lot of research being done on that. And so where I'm actually focusing my research is looking at proteins similar to the proteins we look at in cerebrospinal fluid, um, we're looking at those in the eye. And I feel like um, that might be a more specific way to help uh, diagnose Alzheimer's disease. I think, I think finding the link is the first step. And then we just, we really need to do more research to answer your questions about um, how soon before, um, um, you know, we develop symptoms, can we detect these changes in the eye? Mm -hmm. And, and right now, you're not quite sure how long, how, how far in advance you can see those symptoms. In other words, if you're looking in someone's eye, if you're studying their tear or the fluid on the outside of their eye, can you tell in the very earliest moments, uh-oh, this person's headed for problems. We need to be really proactive with our prevention steps here. Right. How, how early in your researching, right. seeing patients, how early have you been able to detect? So we have been able to detect um, changes um, in live patients in the stage of, um, uh, it's sort of a continuum stage. So we've been able to see levels uh, and the normal cognitive function stage in, and patients with mild cognitive impairment. Um, so we are, we, we did find some evidence that, f that proteins in the vitreous, specifically amyloid beta and tau proteins, do change as patients um, develop uh, cognitive changes mm -hmm. in um, based on mild cognitive dysfunction. And we found this in a group of patients who have eye disease. And we know that patients who have eye disease tend to be an at-risk population. They represent an at-risk at population for dementia. So by studying this population with eye disease, we think that we can gain some insight um, that might be applied to the larger population. So, um, so say, yeah. So to answer your question directly, we don't really know. Uh huh. And when you say eye disease, are you talking macular degeneration? What what kind of eye disease are you seeing in these people who are more likely to develop? Yeah, so, so patients with macular degeneration, patients with glaucoma, mm -hmm. um, uh, those are the two uh, two big ones. And then also patients who have diabetes. We know diabetes alone is a risk factor mm -hmm. for dementia. And patients with diabetes can also develop diabetic changes in the eye called diabetic retinopathy. So the three big ones are glaucoma, macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy. And what? so those, those are the patients that we are looking at. What is that like for you as an ophthalmologist to be on the cutting edge, to be able to be sitting really uh, having an eye appointment is an intimate experience. I mean, you're, you're like 12 inches apart from someone and here you're able to see into their brain by looking at their eye. You must, it, yeah, no, you it's, must be excited. It's really the only sensory that allows us to do that, yeah. where we can look into the eye and be able to visualize a nerve um, that connects the eye to the brain. Um, and so we're able to visualize the optic nerve. We're able to visualize the retina, mm -hmm. um, which um, contains the light receptor cells that receives the visual information we see. So, yeah, so they, you know, as they say, the, the eye is the window to the soul. It's also, it's also very much a window to the brain. Mm -hmm. So when I'm at my ophthalmologist getting my annual appointment, he checks 
my optic nerve back there. How, how much yes. more technology does he or she need in her office to do what you're doing? Is this going to come in a year? Is this just a software upgrade and then all the ophthalmologists can really do this? Are you going to train everybody up? Right. So I think if, you know, if, if the research goes as far as suggesting that um, testing eye fluid can be a diagnostic tool um, or even a screening tool mm -hmm. uh, for eye disease, then that's certainly mm -hmm. something that, um, you know, you can, uh, that, that can potentially be applied broadly, right? So that's, that's the key to a screening tool. It needs to be, uh, you know, non-invasive or minimally invasive, very inexpensive, and something that can be applied broadly. Um, and so, yeah, so that would be, you know, a, um, uh, you know, down the road, if, if all the steps in between point in that direction, um, that could ultimately be something that we do is, is perhaps test eye fluid as a potential means to, to diagnose Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. So what are the next steps for you and your team? You, you've discovered this, you can spot it in the eye fluid. So what are your, what are your next clinical trials going to be to see if you can further this down the road? So the next step really is to um, validate these findings with known um, uh, known markers for dementia. For example, um, we want to we want to check the eye fluid levels and compare them to MRI findings in living patients. So now now we know that there's a connection in the latest stage, which is unfortunately death, and we could actually examine the brain, and we know that there's a, a strong connection there um, with eye fluid. Now, the question is, you know, and to also answer your earlier question, how long preceding that um, are we able to detect those changes? And so we start by validating those results with, for example, the, ch the protein markers in the eye levels. We validate those levels with MRI findings or levels in the cerebrospinal fluid, because right now that's the gold standard. The gold standard for diagnosis is clinical symptoms, you know, MRI uh, changes, um, and, um, and neurocognitive testing, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to try to validate our, um, levels in the eye with those, um, with those changes in the brain that we see on MRI and cerebrospinal fluid. And about how long do you think that this is going to take before you can validate all of those things? It's, it's a good question. You know, we, we all want research to, to happen faster than it actually does. We do. mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's just a question of, you know, it, it can, it may take in the, in the order of, um, you know, months to, to several years. Mm -hmm. I mean, and a lot of it just really depends on, on how much, uh, how many researchers are involved in this. That's why it's, it's really important to, to not be the only one studying this. I think if, if we can get more people interested in looking at the eye, that's going to help the research move forward more quickly, mm -hmm. right? So right now, um, they're very, you know, there are a lot of people that look at, that are looking at um, ocular imaging, looking at for example, optical coherence tomography imaging of the retina and looking at the cell layers. And that's been going on for many years. So there are some, there's some really great data out there looking at that. And, but there aren't a lot of people who are looking at eye fluid specifically mm -hmm. as a means for diagnostic testing. And so the more people we can get that's interested in this research, I think the faster the research will move forward. From a layperson's perspective, when I look into someone's mm -hmm. eyes, like my dad passed with Alzheimer's. I looked into his eyes. He had macular degeneration too. And I could see, or maybe I was imagining it. Can you see like a film? Do their eyes become less clear? Can, can a lay person look in someone's eyes and see anything of import? No, it's difficult. I mean, to, to, to be able to visualize macular degeneration um, it really requires a dilated eye examination and an examination, a direct examination of the retina. And it's not something that's really possible when you're looking directly at someone, uh, someone's eyes. Um, the, the idea of seeing a film, sometimes that's a reflection. Like if he had previous cataract surgery, you can sometimes see a reflection from that. Um, so there, there could be other causes that, that um, other things going on with the eye that, that kind of give the appearance that they may have a film to it, but not usually with macular degeneration. Are you but that's interesting that he had he macular did. degeneration and Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, he did. So that, that 
Yeah. It's, it's what you are noticing in your patients as well. Are you having trouble finding patients right. to participate in this research? Well, right now we have um, been focusing on patients with eye disease, um, and the you know one of the uh, the next steps is to try to um, uh, you know yes get get patients who don't necessarily have eye disease as you know uh, to bring them in on this research. But the, one of the reasons why we focus on patients with eye disease is that it's much easier to obtain fluid specimens from patients who are already in the eye clinic getting clinical care, um, and you know, and they, and they tend to be more, um, obviously, um, uh, more receptive to it because, you know, they are, um, um, they're already there getting, and it's more convenient for them because they're already there getting their eyes taken care of. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question right now. I haven't had a lot of challenges, but that's because we've been focused on patients with eye disease. I think if we try to expand it to a larger population, you know, that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Uh, but my hope is we'll be able to get, um, will be able to get enough patients that agree to participate. So tell me what motivates you. you know, why are you doing this? You know, I, I wish I could say um, I have personal experience with Alzheimer's disease. I do not. Um, you know, we I, I do have some family history of uh, mild dementia, but um, I think I think the um, neuroscience, neurology, and the brain has always fascinated me. Um, and I've always had a, a very keen interest in neuroscience. And yet I became an ophthalmologist, which is, which is obviously somewhat related to neuroscience, but not, not directly, you know, um, involved with the brain. And I think, I think just being able to, to merge the two things that, that I'm passionate about, which is the eyes and the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this research has allowed me to, to do that. Oh, that's great. That's great. So tell me anything more about the research that we should that we should know. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you think is important? Well, um, I think um, I think uh, that, you know, we've we've covered a lot, particularly when it comes to the eyes connection to the brain. I think, you know, the, the big, uh, you know, just taking a big picture perspective, I think that um, patients, you know, who or and family members who have loved ones with Alzheimer's disease, you know, it's just that there's a lot of um, research going into this disorder. There's a lot of um, um, investment by the National Institute of Health, um, you know, particularly the National Institute of Aging. There, um, it's 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 a huge priority for them to um, to fund research related to Alzheimer's disease, particularly in the area of diagnosis and therapeutics. Uh, therapeutics, obviously, because they they want to be able to treat this disorder, and diagnosis is very very important, particularly in as early a stage as we can possibly get it in order to start the therapeutics. Um, in order for them to have meaningful effect. So I, I would say that for people who have loved ones with Alzheimer's disease is to, you know, just stay on top of the research and, you know, people like you, Jane, who are, you know, bringing attention to this, um, to this, um, you know, potentially fatal disease is really, really important. And, um, and I appreciate you doing that. And I appreciate you inviting me to, to uh, talk about this today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for the research that you're doing. Thank you. You have a great day, okay? Okay, I will. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Cutting Edge Health Podcast, created and hosted by Jane Rogers. The website is cuttingedgehealth.com. We hope you enjoyed the show and would very much appreciate your writing a review. They help a lot, and we read each one. Any information shared on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Guest opinions are their own. This podcast is not responsible for the veracity of their statements. The comments expressed are not medical advice. Do not use any of this information without first talking to your doctor. This podcast and Jane Rogers disclaim responsibility for any adverse effects from the use of any information presented. Thank you for listening and have a beautiful day.